welcome. You can hear me now. Okay, the first thing to know is that my name is not actually Amy O'Brien. My name is Amy Lewin. <laughs> there are two Amys at Sifted. Um, and I'm going to welcome my panel on. I have Rodrigo, just Rodrigo, on Twitter. He's very proud of that. <laughs> he is, uh, he has, is at his own family office, the Sepulveda family office. Um, then I have Rodrigo number two, who doesn't, alas, have Rodrigo. <laughs> Twitter because this gentleman stole it. He is a partner at um, Outsize Ventures, which is a deep tech fund based in London. And then I have Agatha Freeman, who is mm -hmm. a partner at Norsken, which I know is not how you pronounce it, but I'm not Swedish, so I can't do it, which is an impact focused fund based in Stockholm. Thank so you. welcome everyone. We all made it. Thank we're you. all nice and cozy on stage, aren't yeah. we? <laughs> um, so we're here to talk about kind of planet, positive, innovation, all that kind of jargon in VC. And the first question I'm going to ask is, is it all bullshit? <laughs> <laughs> and the two South Americans on the panel have promised to be controversial. <laughs> Who wants to go first? Well, I can start. Good morning, everyone. How are you guys feeling? <laughs> Yay! <laughs> OK, I'll start with the answer. It's not bullshit as far as the problem is concerned, right? Um, climate change is happening. I tend to spend a lot of time with wine. Uh, harvests are happening two to four weeks earlier than 10 years ago. Now it's a real problem, right? Now the way to address it is a bit complicated. So my other South American colleague here, also called Rodrigo but not on Twitter, uh, will say maybe ESG is a problem. I was uh, one of the four founding partners at Exxon Capital based in Luxembourg and as a thesis for the fund, uh, we use the UN Sustainable Development Goals to invest. And any company had to address one of the 169 sub-goals, the targets for the NSDGs. And when we started the fund in 2015, that made sense because the goals for the UN SDGs are 2030. Now, if you start a new fund now, it's not long enough in the next eight years to use that as a framework, right? And we invested in companies doing uh, climate monitoring with satellites, with about 150 satellites, went public on the York Stock Exchange. We did you know, carbon reductions, we did refurbished goods, all kinds of things that made sense, but are we making enough of a contribution to solve the real problem? And we're, are we solving it just locally in parts of the world, or are we solving it globally? What do you think? I agree with you 100%. Um, so I, before I started my own firm, I spent four years at SOFB, which is a, a US-based um, deep tech fund um, that invests basically in human and planetary health companies. I mean, invested in 42 companies. And the thing that I found really interesting um, through that journey was that many of the things people thought were going to heal the planet actually were not connected to the problem, right? So, so many things that people thought, okay, maybe this has nothing to do with it, were actually the needle movers. So what we've seen, and, and I find really interesting and connected to yet that is like, it's very hard for people that are not in it to come up with the reasons or, or, the, or the frameworks with one, one thing should, should work or not, when they don't understand how to get there. They don't understand the journey. So we were for the first investors in, in cellular ag agriculture, which is basically clean meat or meat in the lab, right? We, we invest in those companies seven years ago, and, and no one thought that would have a positive impact in the environment. They were like, why are you investing in these crazy people trying to grow meat in the lab, you know? That's very um, inorganic, or like, that's not meat, and whatever. And then, you know, seven years later, those companies would possibly change um, the whole emission situation in the food chain more than anything else. So I think there's a lack of understanding, and the people that really know what they're doing are not the ones setting up the rules, and those people are 10 years behind. Okay. So. You're an impact-focused fund. Do you want to give the other perspective on why <laughs> this is very important? And maybe also how, you know, if you're a VC who wants to invest in impact and sustainability and climate tech, like, what, what looks like, what's a good way to do that, do you think? 
No, absolutely. And maybe I can just touch base back to a little bit what Rodrigo number one said, that the problem is definitely not, uh, as you said, bullshit. <laughs> it is very real. But I think your original question maybe touched up on a little bit that impact investing is trending. If you look at the headlines, it seems that it's overcrowded. When I sit on other panels, I often get questions. Do you still have an edge as an impact investor? Does it still resonate? Because it seems that you know overnight the market has turned all impact investing. But that's so, so far from truth. If you look at the numbers that are actually invested based on a global assets under management, less than 1% have gone actively into impact investing strategies, less than 1% globally. So when, when we talk about you know, impact investing being exaggerated, uh, or so on. For me, it, it, it really does not add up when we actually look at the numbers. And to your second question, why? Uh, of course, it's, in, it's incredibly, incredibly important. I think as impact investors, we're sometimes uh, sort of pressed and questioned, are you really the real deal? Or is it really addressing impact? Does it really make an incremental change? I think, you know, the universe is different. There are the true deep impact investors, we're one of those. Uh, our, our approach is to be really uncompromising when it comes to being impact first investor, but also being uncompromising when it comes to seeking out um, globally fin uh, financial scale. And, uh, but, and again, criticism of the market is there is spillover, maybe there's some greenwashing, but I think we're so early in it that even if there is spillover, even if someone else does not have the deep impact, uh, let's say, ambitions, it's okay, because we still need to grow the market so much. And it's by, by I think, by these spillovers uh, and attracting more capital and attracting more startups chasing the trend, it's how we grow the size of the pie. So, Rodrigo, when you're investing in deep tech startups, do you, do you care if they're, like, green as well? Is that a criteria in, in, in your investment, or is that just, like, a nice side effect? Um, I, I think it's a little bit more than a side effect, but, but, but we are not making investment decisions based on any of those metrics, and we made a conscious decision to do that. Um, we are a deep tech fund run by three journalists, so it's, it's very weird how we invest. And basically what we do is we chase the talent. But what we've seen in the last six, seven years is the best entrepreneurs that we meet are trying to solve huge challenges. And those huge challenges are basically 80, 70 percent around this. So we ended up investing a lot into the space just because we're following the talent. But it's not something we do before, and you know we, we don't make investment decisions based on those metrics because uh, we don't believe that they're um, aligned with you know what real impact might be in 15, 20 years from now. And when when you all three of you are meeting founders, entrepreneurs who are in the kind of climate tech sustainability space, how how much are they grilling you? On this kind of stuff, or are some of them like, I don't care, I, I, I get the I get the climate bit. You just please give me the money. There's a little secret that we don't talk about, in, in our industry, and I'll answer your question. Is we tend to invest with the flavor of the year, right? It was pistachio a couple years ago, so it was called big data AI, and then it was blockchain, and then it was impact. Now it's all about NFT, <laughs> and God knows what it's going to be next year, right? Now, the way we are financed as funds is we have shareholders, and they're called LPs, limited partners. They are all about impact now, and if you do not do impact investing, then they will not invest in you. Hence, the GPs, the general partners, the, the VCs, have to do impact, because otherwise we can't raise money from these guys. Their thinking, however, is not evolved let's put it that way okay so when you're chatting to lps yes. and they're like so there's this new regulation are what, are they, in europe. what are they asking yeah there's this new regulation in, in europe called sfdr so you can't do greenwashing and there are a number of undefined or not totally clear rules in there called article six or eight or nine and if you're not one of those depending on the lp you're talking to they will not give you money or entertain other discussions with you article nine to generalize in like a caricature almost is I'll, uh, I'll tag my carried interest according to goals of companies I've not identified yet or have not even been created yet. 
So if they'd reach their goals 100%, I get my carried interest, which is the money I'm supposed to get. If they don't reach their goals, then I don't get the money. But I don't know what the companies are. They might not even be created. And so it's kind of weird, right? Let's, let's play roulette would be kind of the same thing. The second comment is we do not know how to measure impact today. So we all talk about impact. We've not even defined what impact is, but we don't know how to measure it. And there are a number of initiatives around the world to try to address this. None has been used by everyone. If you remember, if you were around back then, I definitely was, the crisis in 1929 led to the creation of US GAAP, accounting standards, which everyone follows. And Europe tried to follow up in the world with IFRS. Now, there's an initiative in the US to create a standard for measuring impact. There's an initiative in Brussels to try to measure impact. None has been defined, so we don't know what we're measuring. And this is why when I was at Exxon Capital, we used the 169 targets because they're measured specifically and reported every year to the UN General Assembly, right? How? So it's yeah. funny, even, uh, so to answer your question, even an entrepreneur comes to us and says, I do impact this or impact that. I have to use just the framework that I consistently use all the time to try to address the opportunity and figure out whether that is a fit for us and for our LPs. So how do you do this at Northgen? Like, how, how many frameworks do you have and how much is that not really helpful for either you or the startups to be, sorry, which of the 169 goals do you? <laughs> no, it's, it's a really good question. And also, I probably have to disagree with you a little bit because <laughs> since, since we started in the impact investing space, you know, this is exactly what we have done. We've studied every framework in the world, every tool in the world. We've been part of countless roundtables, panels, workshops, etc. And it's frustrating. Why are we trying to overcomplicate it? Because in the end of the day, what we need to do is put our foot down and say which one is an impact company and which one is not. And what are the measurements that we can abide to to track whether this company is going in the right direction or not. So for us, the way it works is that we really believe let's not have Paralysis, analysis, uh, paralysis by analysis. Let's keep it simple, let's keep it transparent, and let's just make sure that we're measuring something and that we're on the right track to, to creating positive change. So how that works in practice is, when it comes to climate companies, it's actually pretty easy to measure. You can link, uh, the way we always look at it is that imp uh, the companies that we invest in, revenue should be one-to-one -one correlated with impact. For a lot of the climate companies, it's simply revenue formula. What's the CO2 emission, uh, emissions saved as, uh, as, a, as a direct consequence of your revenue line growing? For uh, impact companies in the sort of social space, we invest in both companies that are positive, create positive change for people and planet. It's a little bit difficult. You have to be you, you, you have to be a little bit creative. You have to custom make the impact targets for each company. Let, let's take another example, education. Where I've invested in uh, Cognity, which is a fantastic ed tech company. There, the impact KPIs are simple. How many students have you reached? How many classrooms have you reached? And by what percentage have you improved the quality of the exam results as a result of using these tools? So. I'm really skeptical. Why are we trying to find this one magical impact formula? It's just not possible. So let's not complicate it. Let's keep it simple. As long as you're willing to put your foot down, put KPIs down, then you know that you're really walking the talk rather than just talking about impact as some kind of mystical thing. It's really not that complicated. But I have a question there. <laughs> um, and um, in practical terms, right? You have a company. I, I don't know the stage that you guys specifically invest in, but before Series B, like companies are living organisms that are going to change and everything. Like, what happens if you make a decision based on the formula that you think the company is going to hit, and then for the nature of the business, the company needs to switch focus and then will probably not hit those original metrics? Like, how do you deal with that? That's why we do, don't do any of metric. I mean, that's another thing. That's why I fundamentally think that we should just quit trying to find one size fits all solution. It's impossible. The impact measurement frameworks for the later stage companies will always differ to those for earlier stage companies. To your question, we're early stage investor. We we understand that the company, the business models are going to change. They're going to pivot. So it's up to us to really 
put other kind of filters, the stress, the questions that we ask when we invest is, okay, you know, the company is trying to address this problem. Is there any way they can pivot out of being an impact company? Can they pivot out of addressing the problem that they originally set? And if the answer is yes, we're not going to invest. But uh, we're really looking, if you're a healthcare company, I mean, how can you really pivot out of doing good if you're... No, if, but if, if you're measuring you're emissions, for example, and the solution would not drop emissions as much as you said, like, th there might be cases, I think, where... No, that's, that's a good point. Yeah. You could fine-tune it, no. but the bottom line is that this company's goal is to save emissions. Mm -hmm. So whether you save emissions with the business yeah. model 1.0 or business model 2.0, it doesn't really matter. You have to be a little bit flexible if you invest mm -hmm. in early-stage so companies. Let, let, let me make two comments. I sound very cynical, but actually one of my partners, Jerome, wrote an impact report for all of our portfolio companies. It's on Exponent Capital's website, or you can get it on my LinkedIn. So we actually measure a number of things. What we report are some of the uh, 169 goals or targets from the UN SDGs, uh, very specifically. What I want to stress here, however, is that if you want to make a massive positive impact on the planet, you have to think big. And most of the companies we talk to do not think big. So one of my asset tests is to ask them, are you making 100 million revenue in the next five years? You go, whoa, I just lost 99% of the crowd. But some of our companies are actually doing it, and that's how we filter it. Because if you're not making at least 100 million in multi multiple billion markets, then you're not having an impact whatsoever. But is this also right? maybe, this is one of the challenges, like one of the reasons maybe the whole thing is a bit bullshit, because if we want to invest in really, really, really significant technology that's going to help with the climate crisis, it might not be ready in five years to meet your fund criteria, and therefore the average VC is going to invest So when we started in 2015, 2030 was 15 years away. The fund had 10 year time frame. It was in the time frame. I'll give you two examples. We invested in a company in Israel uh, in semiconductors. They have an algorithm that they put onto a chip that optimizes storage controllers. Now, I don't know if you know, but data centers consume five to four to five percent of the world's energy. And what these guys do, they can reduce the energy consumption of the storage base, the disk, by 90 percent, which is overall 30 percent of the cost of uh, a data center. So this company is aiming to reduce one percent of the world's energy consumption. That's very measurable, right? Another company we invested in and uh, was acquired in December by Deliver Hero, it was called Global, out of Spain. Now, when we invested in Global, there was this discussion in California about Assembly Bill 5, sort of the gig economy workers, right? But back then, unemployment in California was 3.7%. Global was headquartered in Barcelona, 25% unemployment in Spain, over 50% for the younger generation. We said, we're investing in this company because we're giving a stepping stone to lots of people who don't have a job, learn how to work again and get some dignity. They were paid over minimum wage. And Global created over 350,000 jobs, right? And because pandemic happened, over 100,000 small businesses could sell online with delivery, and they had no other channel to go to. Mm. I reckon that is impact, mm. right? And it got, goes under prosperity in the UN SDGs, and you can measure it. But that's that not, that's not helping with, like, climate, right? That's <laughs> glo Globo is, well, Globo well, is well, helping well, us, like, <laughs> get it, some food well, delivered. impact is not uh, only climate. There are 17 UN SDGs. Yeah. Right? There's prosperity, there's life above water, life below water, and a number of other things. I think yeah. we need to think bigger than global yeah. though right now. Yes, I agree. I, I, I kind of, I think um, if I understood your question also correctly, it, it's really about this, that, you know, the, the true breakthrough that, you know, innovations that leapfrog us into the next generation, uh, they're capital intensive and they take a long time. And the typical VC model is, you know, 10-ish years plus minus, but you kind of want to start to see exits in five to seven years. Yeah. I think that's what you're touching up on. I think you're right. When we started investing in Impact five years ago, we were, to be honest, a little bit of the classic uh, VC, which is, you know, software is scalable. That's where the returns are. Hence hardware, hence the really difficult problems, the really difficult innovations just don't fit the VC model. But that's changed dramatically over the last five years. I think there is a momentum building. There is a strong sense of urgency around all the climate themes. And we see more and more capital flowing there, including VC capital. And I think what's happening is now that 
you know, that there is a realization that, that you know, to same the climate crisis, it's not enough with the bits, or it's the classic atoms versus the bits, you know, software being all about bits, but to actually create something meaningful for our planet, we need to touch the atoms. And atoms is the space where it's hard, it takes time, it's capital intensive, but it's very early days, but I think the VC model is changing, and we're starting to see that you can actually invest in solutions that maybe have 10 years time horizon to commercialization, maybe 20 years horizon to fully you know, realize your full spectrum returns. But we see that the secondary market is building for that. It's maybe bad time to talk about SPACs, given uh, the beating that it's been <laughs> taken in the market. But for a while, SPACs were you know, looking really promising as a way to back these uh, long time horizon projects, but still be able to exit and get to your VC returns. So I would say your, your question is absolutely spot on. I think it's still early days, but I see that the market is changing for creating exit opportunities, even for VC investors for these long-term yeah. projects. So how did you think about deep tech is famously one where, you know, <laughs> not always quick wins. How did you think yeah. about that when you were raising the fund and yeah, in terms of uh, what you invest in? Yeah, yeah, totally. I, I think that for us it was really important to understand that, you know, we were looking at a very specific subset of this company. So it's like, for example, to give you an example, like at my other fund and investing in a lot of these companies building, you know, um, meat in the lab. And for that, you need a lot of technologies that are not yet widely available to make it cheaper. So it's like what we are looking for is, yes, those companies that might need, you know, the capital expenditure that is above the average software company, but that can still move fast. That's a reality of the product that we turn around and sold to our LPs, right? So we look, for example, right now in companies developing bioreactors with the Amazon Web Services model, right? Like that would be something that would require money that would not come from the VC to build a reactor, but to support the operations. That would unlock this whole industry that is in capital intensive by nature. So we, we pick very specific um, subsectors. But at the end of the day, we follow the, the, the talent. If we meet a fantastic entrepreneur saying, you know, I'm going to build a space station, we'll give him or her a check. You know. yeah. Yeah. And you said earlier that you feel like the flavor of the quarter year is NFTs. Does that mean <laughs> climate tech? startups that can save the planet, we're done, we're just interested in the alternative reality of the metaverse and NFTs these days. I stand by what I said. There's a flavor every year of something that everyone <laughs> seems to talk about, report in the press, media, conferences, or LPs are interested in, right? But again, I started by saying climate is a real problem and we should try to solve it as fast as we can. In all ways we do. Back in the day, if you were not using electricity, then you were not modern. Then if you were not using AI, you were not modern. I think now that if you're not trying to solve climate in some way or another with your investments, then Which, you shouldn't what, be in here. What kind of solutions are you really looking for? Like what kind of startups do you really want to see? What kind of problems do you really want to see companies tackling that you're not, you know, you, <laughs> there's enough NFT people. <laughs> what other ones do we want to see? Uh, so really a range. We invest across all the themes in, in the overarching theme is pos companies that have positive, meaningful impact for people and planet. But let's say themes that are, in our opinion, trending right now that are super exciting for planet, but super exciting for from an investment perspective as well, is um, on the back of the changing regulation, the software space around taxonomy uh, and, and the software opportunities that are coming out of that. And again, I just said that bits are not going to change the world. This is actually an exception because in some ways, if we change the existing industry, we can have so much more impact than if one you know, really successful impact company takes off. And we see you know, the carbon accounting and, and companies that are really trying to help us get on board with taxonomy uh, has, has the potential to create huge change. Other areas more in the hardware, you know, the atom space, uh, carbon removal, uh, super exciting. I think we saw just last week or two weeks ago that Lower Carbon came out with a fund dedicated just purely on carbon removal opportunities. So really exciting. Uh, and I guess uh, and next generation energy is also on the top of the list. And, and we're starting to see that there are a lot of really exciting companies that, that still fit the VC model 
while addressing uh, really hard to solve uh, R&D challenges. No, what, what, I, I, would easy. Yeah, <laughs> I would agree 100%. We, we follow the, the talent and in the carbon accounting space, we follow the, the best CEO in Europe, I think. Um, um, apologies to the lady that was here before, but uh, we invested in a Meetwise, um, which mm -hmm. is a carbon accounting company um, out of London. And again, for us, it's not so much about the spaces specifically, but about the talent, but we, we would love to find something around nuclear energy. And that was the start of our discussion with us, like, would, should we take the, as, you know, um, the, the, the metrics to, to kind of make investment decisions, and when nuclear was not inside that, we said, like, this is bullshit. I cannot answer that question. I don't know what's next. I've been in this <laughs> industry for the past 25 years. If I ever knew what was next, I would not be sitting here. I would be on an island somewhere, right? <laughs> so I don't know. Yeah. But what I can say, having observed this industry for a long time, is that the degree of digitization of the economy is not there yet, right? There's so much opportunity coming in a lot of different areas. And it's fantastic that entrepreneurs do things that we deem impossible. And because they don't know it's impossible, they actually do it, right? Um, just a note on the amount of startups that has come out. I tend to uh, be upset by the 10x factor, right, of people who pretend to be entrepreneurs who want to create startups. I don't think big enough, not solving real problems. So we have to spend much, much more time sorting through not great stuff to find the right amount to invest in the right company. The good companies have not grown that much. The bad companies have grown a lot. And sorry to say, the bad investors have also joined the bands here. So there's a lot of noise happening at early stage, a lot of noise happening at much later stage, pushing the valuations up, which are crazy. Um, I think we need a bit of discipline in this industry. How, right. how, who's going to do that? Collectively, who, who we should Who kicks out do. the shit VCs and the shit startups? <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> we, we should not be funding companies that are not solving a real problem or big enough problem. They're lifestyle companies that are not made for at least professional investors. You know, mom and pop shops, there's tons of those. Noise. Well, who's going who's gonna to be listed on Globo if none of those companies are <laughs> back? Okay, final question. Can VCs save the planet? Or actually, VCs really can't and we need Absolutely government. Not. I, I, I'll and, start. You know. Absolutely not. It's <laughs> the entrepreneurs. We are just people that are lucky enough to be able to take a little part of their life's journey and be there with them. And if we manage to do that, we're just lucky. So my opinion is VCs, hell no. But startups, yes? A hundred percent. Okay. I would say nobody can. Nobody can do it alone. It's really about ecosystems. Startups need investors. <laughs> um, startups need clients. We still need a really good governance and policy to operate, so we need the public sector to participate. We basically need everyone to be part of saving the planet, and there is no single sharpshooter that's going to solve Elon the problems of our Elon is pretty close to that, though. Elon is pretty close to that, yeah. Uh, no. <laughs> do, you think, do you think any of them are like lagging? Is, you know, do clients, do big corporates really need to pay more attention? Is it governments who are a bit behind the curve? Or just you know, everyone. I'll, I'll make two comments again. Um, if you look at 20 years ago, the top 10 market capitalization um, of companies, nine out of 10 were not tech companies, and that was about 2.5, 2.7 trillion. 20 years later, we're at 12.5, 12.7 trillion. Nine out of 10 are tech companies, and those nine out of 10 tech companies were funded by VCs, right? Some of the household names you use every single day were funded by VCs. Right. If you go to an Airbnb, which is a company that was funded a Series B back in 2009, right, funded by VCs. None of those ones are saving the Right, you're running around here in bulk, funded by VCs, right? So we are part of the solution, and probably we are very lucky to be an industry that moves faster, exponentially faster than other industries. So I would argue that yes, VCs are part of the solution to save the planet. There we go. Good note to end on. Thank you very much to my panel. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you for the great Thank questions. <laughs> um, I'm going to spend the last 46 seconds plugging Sifted. So if you're not signed up to Sifted, we are the leading European tech media publication. Uh, please sign up. We have newsletters. And if you're from around here and you're free on Tuesday, Sifted is holding an event in Tallinn on Tuesday. It would be great to see you there. Thank you. <laughs>